now um, kickstart the amazing lineup that we have. And our very first presentation is um, is titled uh, Working in Partnership in Sierra Leone uh, by Alan Fricker um, from King's College London. Um, Alan is going to talk about how he was able to build on areas of personal interest to deliver a partnership project working across multiple organizations and countries. I will now hand over to Alan. Um, so thanks Masood and uh, I'm really pleased to be able to come and talk to you. I'm the Head of Clinical Library Services at King's College London and I'm going to talk about some work that we did uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, King's I'm sure will be familiar to most of you um, but the impact of health at King's is really important. Uh, it's a huge part of the life of the university and more than half of the, the kind of uh, students and work that we do is in that area. We sign up thousands of NHS users to our libraries every year. Uh, here we are at the medical library at Tommy's. You can tell it's a medical library because of the ashtrays, uh, basically. Uh, but it's a really important part of what we do. And service is also a really important part of uh, King's. Uh, the King Strategic Vision 2029 places service very much at the heart of what the university is trying to do with an ambitious goals to try to make a better world, uh, which I think is, is something that we can uh, uh, all get behind. In terms of libraries and collections, well, we work right across uh, multiple sites. Uh, we're very much in the spirit of the King's Health Partners Academic Health Science mission, uh, dealing with education, research, patient care. And we've got an ongoing commitment uh, to service ourselves. We've been very successful uh, in uh, going through the various levels of the NUS sustainability uh, scheme. Uh, we got a Green Gown Award actually uh, to recognise our efforts. But we're also involved in all sorts of things like Wrap Up London and Waterloo Food Bank, things that reflect the kinds of commitments uh, that members of staff and interests that they have. So why Sierra Leone? Well, I, I came to King's about seven years ago now, and I was aware of King's Sierra Leone partnership. Uh, people may have heard of them through the work that they did um, around Ebola, but actually that, that's not their, their main focus. Their main focus is on building uh, educational capacity um, in that country. So, uh, for example, they made it possible to complete a postgraduate medical education training um, in, in Sierra Leone without having to go abroad. Um, and so they were on my to-do list, basically. We often have these to-do lists. Uh, I had an interest uh, in um, partnerships in health information work that previously used to happen. And you get nudges. And so I had a little nudge. I was the chair of a talk uh, by a charity called African Hospital Libraries, a health libraries group conference. Um, and they are a fantastic small charity um, working in Sierra Leone where they have been building up and actually building uh, quite recently uh, libraries uh, serving the hospitals in each of the regions of Sierra Leone. Um, do have a look at them and support them if you're able. And I, I love the fact that we have uh, common uh, issues. This was a, a user feedback from their uh, a survey that they ran and actually you could swap some of the headings but I'm sure a lot of us will find those as familiar issues um, so they were great and uh, to start with what I did was actually use them as uh, a way to make a connection so I put together King Sierra Leone partnership and African hospital libraries and they had a, a meeting and we discussed some of the kind of possibilities for working together uh, and making those connections and I also started engaging the library team uh, as well because I wanted them to, to think about what might be possible and so we did a bit of uh, fundraising, which included me running a great big loop around uh, all of our different libraries, uh, 17 kilometers. And it turns out lots and lots of steps. Didn't realize quite how many of our libraries were upstairs until I had to run up them all. Um, and we raised enough money to effectively fund a salary uh, for a member of library staff in Sierra Leone for a year. So a small thing, but a, a really good thing. We pushed on from that to try and do something a bit broader and we hosted and facilitated a stakeholder day for African hospital libraries, very much inspired by uh, Shane Godbolt, who's uh, sadly passed a little while ago. Um, but she's a, a huge inspiration uh, in terms of linking together different people across global health librarianship. And so we had all sorts of people represented from uh, Book Aid, uh, INASP, um, Medical Aid Films and uh, Public Health England and on and on and on. And so it's really good to make those different connections, see people uh, hear about what they were doing and help African hospital libraries prepare a uh, kind of future strategy. And when you do things with people, things then uh, happen. Uh, so I'd seen uh, something around research for life and uh, grants, um, but I'd kind of thought, oh, I'm a bit too busy, can't do it at the moment. And then uh, Max from King Sierra Leone Partnership got in touch and said, what do you think? Shall we have a go? And so uh, we did. Uh, those who don't know, Research for Life basically is a publisher initiative. Uh, they work in to connect 
developing world researchers with the international scientific community, uh, particularly in terms of trying to reduce publishing gap, but also around access uh, to resources. Um, and the big thing that uh, is of interest in this particular project was uh, Hinari, it's one of their subject portals. Uh, there's about 160, 70 publishers involved and they've got fantastic resources, certainly better resources than um, I had available at some of the libraries I've worked at in the past. Um, so it's a, a really great initiative. Uh, I believe it has been continued uh, and renewed for a further period at present. And we made that joint bid. We worked with the team in Sierra Leone, uh, contact with the librarians and it was great and we were successful. Um, and then a uh, moment of panic, uh, actually we could only send one person and the person that I was hoping to send has uh, skedaddled off uh, to uh, Bristol uh, to work in a different library there. So it uh, turns back around to me. So that's uh, a lesson. Uh, so it's our deeds that define us and it was gonna be down to me uh, to head to Sierra Leone. Uh, did a lot of remote partnership. Uh, so Hanari have Creative Commons licensed materials. I needed to go over review and check those things and worked with uh, Lenny Ryan in the States on that but also uh, connecting to the team uh, in Freetown, uh, some difficulties actually uh, with uh, internet and all the rest of it. I may have made a mobile phone call to Sierra Leone. I'm not entirely sure what that will have cost, uh, but it was great to be engaging people and making plans to do things uh, together. And before I knew it, I found myself uh, in Freetown. Uh, it's quite an exciting arrival in Freetown at night if you've never done it. Uh, I'm not going to say it all now, not enough time, but I was still preparing my materials and copying loads of copies of the slides onto USB sticks as a really good, we thought, way uh, to share things with the participants at the end. So what did we actually do? So it was a week long series of workshops. We ran the same workshop in the morning and in the afternoon uh, to try and get as many people through as possible. Uh, we had 25 people all together with about one to two librarians to uh, educators and it was really important that we brought those groups together because we wanted to encourage that partnership as well. Um, and we were trying to really push on and think about more than just point and click because there's an enormous amount of content so it's quite hard to get out from underneath it all uh, when you're talking to people. Uh, there was a big focus on peer partnership. This is uh, Mr. Sisse, he's the, the librarian uh, at Comas and he'd helped uh, define uh, some of the areas of the workshop. Um, and that was what we were really keen to do was focus actually on building skills within that librarian team and also building confidence uh, to think about how they would uh, roll uh, some of what they'd learned on, but also how they might build services around the things that are within. Uh, in our had a quick visit to his uh, library at one point. This was when the lights had come back on. Uh, you can see students busy working away, uh, quite well equipped with books, but the IT space at the back there was not plugged in. And I think that was pretty uh, typical of some of the challenges in Sierra Leone around uh, IT things, but it was great to hear uh, more about how they were working and their plans um, and uh, to try and uh, encourage and, and understand where we might go. I, I couldn't have done it uh, without the partnership with King Sierra Leone uh, partnership, I would say. Uh, they did a huge amount of logistics. This is the drive uh, from where I was staying to the hospital in the morning. Freetown is a very hectic place. Uh, this is on railway road. Um, it's a kind of flying bridge. And, um, but they did huge things around um, housing, lunch even in the hospital canteen, uh, printing, all of these things. So that was uh, really important. And Val, the person who's in the background of that last picture was the second trainer in effect. Challenging uh, to continue that work, we have tried to do it. There's various write-ups uh, that we're still engaged in just uh, completing uh, the last bits. COVID put a big spanner in those works. And I think that's uh, something where need to return and try and see how we can better at those connections, particularly around trying to encourage some professional linking. Personally, it was a hugely uh, intense <laughs> but rewarding thing, um, really using stuff that I've learned in my career over, over 20 years um, and putting it to, to really good use. I always feel lucky that I do useful work, but this was kind of level above on that. Um, also learn what it feels like to run in 40 degrees of heat, which is not great, I can confirm. And uh, finally, I say Sierra Leone is a, a beautiful place. I hope people will have the opportunity at some point uh, to go there. Partnership work has been fantastic for us to be involved in. And it's a real way for us to bring our skills into play and make a difference in our institutions and beyond. Thank you. 
Um, I will now swiftly move on to our uh, next lightning talk, which is on the topic of making culture change, open scholarship, community building, the why and how. I'm delighted to welcome Hardy Shom for this presentation. Hardy is the open scholarship librarian at the National University of Ireland in Galway, and he's also the co coordinator of the open scholarship community Galway. Welcome Hardy and over to you. And I will talk about why and how open scholarship communities can help with culture change. And um, my talk really starts with the, the dream we all share, which is that in the not so distant future, we live in a world where open practices are embedded in the research and publication cycle. Um, where all scientific research will be freely available to people within and outside of academia and where eventually we can drop open altogether because research is open by default. But how do we get there? How do things change? Um, and how does a large group like uh, researchers collectively change their behavior? And I think there has been uh, surprisingly little uh, thought from stakeholders on how this change might work. And it is only really in the past uh, two or three years that main players like funders um, have started to think about this. Now, on a high level, funders have paid attention to the importance of culture change. So here you can see one example uh, from the EU Commission's open science policy. Open science relies on the combined effects of technological development and cultural change. Well, and you can find uh, similar um, statements from, from other funders. So it is important that culture change, changes, but how does it change? Well, I find it helpful to work uh, with a culture change model. And the one that I like most, and you might be familiar with this one, it's from the Center for Open Science. And according to this model, there are five kind of layers that work together to stimulate change of culture. And they are policies, incentives, communities, user experience, and infrastructure. Now, which of these five layers have been the most important one for funders and universities? I guess we can agree that policies is the layers most considered as well, probably to a lesser extent, infrastructure the central part of the pyramid, the communities, often gets overlooks, uh, overlooked and seems under supported, supported. And in my opinion, this could offer an opportunity for libraries. So what are open communities that can help with culture change? Well, such communities will be researcher led and bottom up inclusive of all disciplines. They make open scholarship knowledge and know-how more visible and accessible. They shape the transition to open scholarship so it is most beneficial for researchers, science and society. And they also build personal and professional networks of like-minded members. So has anyone tried this form of community building? Well, all eyes on the Netherlands, um, they have come up with the concept of open science communities. And as you can see here, there are currently 11 of them from Groningen up north to Maastricht in the south of the country. Now the first and to my knowledge, <coughs> most advanced is the open science community <coughs> in Utrecht. The initiative started with two researchers called Anita and Luke, one from linguistics and one from psychology. And they <clears throat> started the OSC as a grassroots initiative in their own time and even with their own money to cover initial costs like um, running a website. And they later partnered with a Utrecht University Library. So we like the Dutch community idea, but how can we adapt it to our, our environment in Ireland and Galway? Well, first we had a very uh, we had a close look at the very useful um, start your own OSC guide written by Anita and Luke. In in ten points, they present a useful step by step guide that we used in our planning. So here you can see a condensed version of the ten step guide. So in bold you can see <clears throat> the steps that we have already taken 
or that we are working on. And I will highlight some of the steps that I think are particularly important. Now, the first step is to find open scholarship enthusiasts at your institution. Well, at NUI Galway, uh, these enthusiasts, they do exist, but they're often individuals, not groups, and not connected beyond institutional divisions. So initially, I had um, conversations with a dozen or so enthusiasts, and I introduced them to the idea of starting a community. Um, the next important step was to create a visual identity, so a logo, a website, Twitter account, and our new friends in Utrecht were kind enough to design the logo that visually links us to, um, with the Dutch communities. Well, the next action and on Utrecht's guide, that was maybe the most significant one. And also I thought, well, this could go wrong. Well, I asked people to sign up to the community and put their name. And as you can see here, <clears throat> their picture to it. Um, our success so far, um, we have <clears throat> currently 43 members and more than 80 people signed up to our community mailing list. Compared to some of the Dutch communities, this is modest. But um, considering our circumstances, uh, we think that is a, a good number. So you have some members, what is next? Well, next is organizing events. Um, so we had our first meeting of interested staff and students in November, 2019. And you can see our events of the first six months of the community here. And I should say that we understand open scholarship as a umbrella term for a lot of open practices that not only include open access and data management, but also open education, citizen science and, and others. And we launched the community officially during our open scholarship week in May last year. Um, and that week of talks and workshops was put together by the open scholarship community members. The library provided some help in the logistics, but the program was crowdsourced. And in this spirit, we launched our virtual open scholarship cafes, and you can see some examples here. Again, topics and speakers are community sourced with the library chipping in with some related subjects like Plan S and transformative agreements. And now we are in the final stages of preparing our Open Scholarship Week 2021. The organizing committee consists of seven community members. And you can see here some of the things we are preparing, um, including an Open Scholarship Prize for research students. So what have we learned so far? Um, We've been working on our community in Galway for a good year. So this involved the investment of some of our library resources, mainly staff time. Um, we've connected more than 40 supporters in a network and our cafes typically get 30 to 50 registrations. And on average, we do about one cafe a month. Um, we also gained some recognition from senior management and I would say we have a certain momentum now, is this momentum uh, easy to maintain, especially in a pandemic? No, it's not. But we do have the opportunity now in the circumstances, maybe more than before, to connect with a wider international network of equally minded communities. So why are we doing this? Why is the library involved in building communities? Now, this is an ongoing discussion. Um, we do share values and practices with open communities, but it is a challenging uh, balance um, between library involvement and researcher-led action. There's also the question of how much nurturing and support uh, the community needs before it mostly runs itself. So we believe that an open community is an important step towards culture change. It is one where library, libraries can play an important role. And even if this role is um, difficult to define, culture change is complex and slow, but without communities, this won't happen. So if you feel inspired uh, to start your own open community, please uh, get in touch. I think a network of open communities on the British Isles and beyond would be fantastic. So, uh, 
Thanks for listening and here are my details if you want to get in touch. Thank you so much, Hardy, for a fantastic presentation and for also uh, really tangible, practical steps on how to build an open scholarship community. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, we will now move on to our third presentation, uh, which is going to be delivered by Lancaster University Libraries, Phil Cheesman and Josh Sandel. Phil's leadership portfolio includes academic engagement and Lancaster's special collections and archives while Josh heads up the library services for research, including open access, research data management, and research intelligence. They're going to talk about making space for research. I'll now pass on to Phil and Josh. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for the introduction, Masood. Library services for research at Lancaster have developed significantly over the last five or so years, becoming a core area of business. Although initially driven by compliance requirements, research services have extended to encompass a broader remit. And it's a key area of focus in our vision for the future. We have well-established services for open access publishing, research data management, and research intelligence, which encompasses bibliometric citations analysis and altmetrics. And the university has invested significant resource in the library, recognizing the value that we contribute. And we've developed new roles, new skills, and new relationships, both within and beyond the university. We're by no means alone in these developments and reports from RLUK and LIBA, uh, the Association of European Research Libraries, have highlighted the emerging role for libraries right across the sector in non-traditional areas of research support, including the digital humanities and digital scholarship more broadly. So are we ready to take on these roles? Well, to do so requires not just appropriate skill sets, but a reframing of traditional perceptions of what a library is and does. We need to understand and expand our role as a service provider, but also as a partner in the research process. We need to make space for research. In 2019, we formed the Library's Digital Humanities Special Interest Group, which provides developmental and horizon scanning opportunities for our staff. And that initiative has brought the researcher voice into the library, engaging a diverse group of staff and creating partnership opportunities for the future. At an early session, Dr. Patti Marietta Flores introduced us to her Digging Into Early Colonial Mexico project. The highly interdisciplinary team combines different techniques, including corpus linguistics, text mining, natural language processing, machine learning, and geographic information systems. Um, and they use these techniques to perform a large scale computational analysis of 16th century historical sources. We've also heard from libraries um, at San Diego State University and the University of California, who shared their invaluable experience of establishing new services and partnerships. And alongside these events, we've been working on projects to develop our capability and activities associated with the digital humanities. Uh, so uh, early projects we undertook included digitizing and transcribing the Satterthwaite letter books, which are three volumes held in the library contain hundreds of letters written by an 18th century Lancastrian that provide a rich insight into his life and business dealings in Lancaster and in the West Indies. In another project, working in partnership with the History Department, we've created a digital collection of letters written by, uh, by John Welcher, solicitor from Lancaster who served in the King's Own Royal Regiment during the First World War. Now, these relatively modest projects have been undertaken with minimal additional resource, but have been invaluable for our staff in developing skills, gaining confidence, and building credibility and partnerships. They've provided some tangible benefits, including opportunities for placements for MA students and engagement with collections in teaching, curriculum design, and schools outreach. Smaller projects, have in turn led to more significant developments, including a three-year AHRC funded project to digitize an existing research collection held by the library. 
The collection documents the experiences of 1930 cinema goers and comprises recordings of interviews, memorabilia and associated research outputs. The library has worked in partnership with the research team from the beginning, contributing to, the de to developing the funding application, recruiting RAs to the team and working alongside them throughout the project. It's been very much a, a shared opportunity, uh, a, sh a shared journey and learning experience. We're now working with staff from the Department of the English Literature and Creative Writing, who've begun another AHRC funded project to digitize and transcribe all 75 of Humphrey Davies' notebooks. We're really excited about this project, not only because of its interdisciplinary theme, but also that it embraces open research practices, including citizen science using the Zooniverse platform to crowdsource transcriptions. Outputs from both these projects will be amongst the first uh, collections to feature on our newly launched Lancaster Digital Collections platform. We're joining the University of Manchester in partnering with the University of Cambridge to further develop the platform they created. Establishing Lancaster Digital Collections has been core to the ambitions we have for our special collections archives and research outputs. Its development also represents a true partnership between uh, the library and academic staff. Most visible sign of the library's commitment to research, though, I guess is uh, the opening of an extension uh, in April this year. Uh, a significant proportion of the ground floor will literally make space for research. The design of the space has been developed in partnership with researchers and has generated many ideas for future collaboration. The ground floor features digital scholarship and open research labs, a digital studio maker space, and an exhibition and event space, as well as specialist facilities, including an ESRC funded safe pod that provides secure access to research data sets. It will be a flexible space that can be reconfigured for different scenarios, activities and requirements, and also be highly visible, showcasing research activity as well as outputs. It will be a discipline inclusive space providing somewhere to connect and collaborate, a place where library staff, researchers, students and our wider community can work together. Engaging with our researcher community is a joy. It's a joy and a shared passion. And it's that passion tempered with practicality and playfulness that generates innovative ideas. At a recent Digital Humanities Forum, we discussed the range of activities listed in RL UK's Digital Scholarship Report. Now, this sparked an idea which has led to a pioneering project with ISS, who are RIT services, to render a skill search feature over our campus map to help colleagues make crucial connections with partners, augmenting or strengthening the overall skills profile that can be forged for a digital scholarship project. That example and our journey is emblematic of our vision for the future. And as we progress towards 2025, we will continue to be a library that is at the very heart of our university community, locally and globally. We will position the library where there is no separation between digital or physical, inhabiting and engaging across both spaces, acting as a catalyst for initiatives across the institution. We'll engage in disruptive innovation, active in areas that are not traditionally seen as library business. Our experience then shines a radiant light upon the significant mutual benefits gained from reframing and investing in relationships between the library and our research community. Now, our experience was once a vision and a vision which seemed far off on the horizon. But in order to reach that horizon, you have to start your journey. And that journey can only begin when you let go your lines, hoist your sails and head out of the harbour. Our journey demonstrates how digital scholarship initiatives that build on existing special collections, emerging technologies and techniques enables a transition from service provider to partner to pioneer. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Phil and Josh, and thank you for sharing this journey with us as well. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions coming on uh, your ambitions and how they've been made a reality. 
I'll now move on to our fourth presentation of the day, which is on the topic of digital transformations in research libraries, limitless, limitless opportunities or limiting challenges by Rosie Jelfs of Durham University. Rosie is um, the information services manager at Durham University Careers and Enterprise, looking after a range of resources and platforms that support students and graduates at all points in their career journey. Rosie is particularly interested in digital developments and the use of artificial intelligence in higher education. Welcome, Rosie, and over to you. Thank you, Masood. So yes, hi, I'm Rosie Jelfs, and I am the Information Services Manager at Durham University Careers and Enterprise. Um, I worked at Durham University Library for five years, where between my job and my LAS MSc, I started to be involved in digital development. And then 18 months ago, I moved to Careers and Enterprise to manage their specialist information service, where we're in the midst of implementing a long term digital development strategy that did precede the pandemic. But of course, it's also been affected by it. Our service offers support to students at all stages of career planning and application, and we have a lifetime support offer to our graduates as well. So today I have for you some thoughts around digital transformations in libraries um, and the challenges and opportunities they present us with. This involves a lot of questions and I'll be really honest and say that I don't really have any answers to those questions. I first put the content for this presentation together in January 2020 and I was trying to find ways to articulate that while I'm a huge proponent of digital services and technology and development and the benefits they bring, I think we need to be really conscious of the motives behind implementing digital developments and of the ways that they could reduce students overall learning opportunities by just providing a digital shortcut. And then, well, we all know what happened this time last year and libraries and other university services sprung into action, coming up with fantastic, innovative ways to support students in an exclusively digital environment. Not doing so would, of course, have been devastating for students. But even though the pandemic has forced us into digital overdrive and to develop in ways some never thought possible, I think these questions still bear thinking about for the longer term. As we transition to the new normal, we'll have big decisions to make about what digital changes we keep and what we relegate to a pandemic service necessity. University libraries are a vital part of producing well-rounded graduates able to be positive contributors to society. But what does this really mean? We have increasingly diverse and digitally dependent student bodies and digital developments generally help us support them better. But there are also questions in my mind about the impact digital transformations across an institution have on the education that we're providing. These questions relate particularly to aspects of service that have become self-service, become automated or where users interact with a screen rather than face to face. Are we increasing user independence? reducing soft skills development or a bit of both and how do we balance what we're adding and taking away one of my colleagues recently conducted a survey with graduate employers that our service works with and asked them to rate different capabilities and skills according to the importance of prospective graduate employees having them communication and teamwork were top and I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone really but I think it's worth noting as graduates are still expected to have developed these skills despite being in an environment that is increasingly lacking in face-to-face -face contact and the traditional methods for gaining these skills. Of course an indisputable positive impact of a move towards digital services is that they generally improve access for users who might otherwise find making the most of library services challenging whether that's due to a disability, their location or any other factor. Balancing inclusivity and enabling students with encouraging independence is really important. Digital services um, allow us to help users wherever they are, support those with additional needs to a higher standard and be more flexible toward everyone's individual interaction preferences. However, this surely affects the way users perceive staff and how staff perceive students. How might users interacting with a screen rather than a person affect their perception of library staff? Digital does not necessarily equal available 24 seven, but it can create the expectation that services do operate that way, especially now when so many people are working remotely. 
how do we manage the expectations of a generation who can simply swipe left? On the flip side, how do digital developments impact the staff perceptions of users? In general, it's much easier to be vocally negative or positive via digital media, as well as the increased risk of misinterpretation without the social aids of tone of voice and body language. Does this worsen the perception of staff who monitor those channels, or is there more opportunity for positive feedback? Our inquiry staff have definitely noticed a significant increase recently in appreciative emails from students who have emailed asking for help, and this used to be a bit of a rarity. Whether they are more grateful for any help at all in these uncertain times or whether this is a digital behaviour change, I'm not sure, but it certainly makes my team smile and that's always a good thing. I think approachability is a priority for a lot of libraries um, to give users the confidence that they can come and ask for help. And often this is in, uh, used in reference to staff, but it doesn't just apply to them. We need all of our services to be approachable and not intimidating so users can take full advantage of them. How do we make a virtual service approachable to all with the range of technical abilities an average student body has? It's a stereotype that today's students are all completely comfortable navigating the digital landscape. Like any skill, there is a range of abilities, including those who, for whatever reason, would prefer to engage with technology as little as possible. While digital capabilities are a requirement of today's world, we can't assume that all of today's students can intuitively navigate anything we put in front of them. or We risk alienating a proportion of students who arguably need us the most. Nobody likes to admit their perceived weaknesses, and we need to provide opportunities for everyone to engage in ways that don't draw public attention to what they feel they can't do. And with digital transformation being a generally expensive process, it's important to question the motives behind developments, pandemic aside, of course. Are they necessary to genuinely improve the user experience of the service? And how do they impact skill development? An example of this might be the many potential users of drones. How about an army of intelligent book delivery drones? Users could order a book from the fourth floor while sitting at a desk on the first, saving them the effort of having to look up the shelf mark and browse the shelves. And while they're at it, the drones could be policing study areas for noise in a silent area or food in a non-food area. This is a librarian drone after all. Uh, taking away the need for users to self-police and talk to their peers. What about an Amazon Prime Air style delivery system for users anywhere on campus who need the information right now? Or better yet, how about anywhere in a specified radius? Why not let a user have a book delivered to them at the top of a touchscreen without them even having to get out of bed? Now, I don't know about anyone else. Right now, I would love to be able to do book deliveries by drone. They'd protect my team and the borrower as well as mean the borrower doesn't have to come onto campus. But in a post-pandemic world, I don't think it is a bad thing for someone wanting a print book to navigate a library and find what they need if they're able to in terms of information literacy and basic navigational skills. So much of our culture now has become about instant gratification, being able to order something for online, online for next day delivery, and this can create a skewed view of the world that everything in life is as easy as clicking a button. Are we setting students up for failure if we buy into this model? Of course, digital literacy and skills are an important part of a university education, so need to be embedded not just in the curriculum, but also in how students interact with other services. Going back to the employer survey I mentioned before, employers were also asked to rate individual aspects of digital capabilities and information literacy ranked third out of these overall, with 71% of employers expecting graduates to have that capability. Only digital etiquette and proficiency with Microsoft Office ranked higher. Among the technology and small and medium employers survey, it ranked second, with only digital etiquette being more important. So information literacy is not only a skill vital to completing a degree, but it's also a skill graduates need in order to secure employment. And of course, another very important benefit of digital transformation is that when done well, it allows us to make the most of both our human centred services and technology, providing a seamless, enhanced and user centred service. Of course, we could take the attitude of does any of this matter? The number of graduate jobs that require remote working is increasing, as well as the requirement to work with screens and apps rather than with people. So do we need to worry about graduates being emotionally intelligent and able to have difficult conversations face to face? 
as I've already discussed, employers still expect these skills. So yes, it does matter. And by the way, I've not even touched on the subject of user want versus user need, but that's for another day. So I've asked a lot of questions. I've given you no answers. And I'm not even sure, to be honest, exactly what I think about some of these things, but hopefully provoke some thoughts about how we need to balance digital transformation with the needs of today's users and tomorrow's graduates. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rosie. It sparked lots of food for thought, I'm sure, for many of the audience members um, here as well. Uh, I'll now move on to our fifth presentation uh, and our last presentation of the day, which is on, well, of this session, to be fair, which is on the topic of OAPEN and uh, the University of Glasgow uh, by Vadri McCutcheon, the Research Information Manager at the University of Glasgow, and Tom Mostert, Community Manager, Director of Open Access Books and OAPEN. Uh, two organizations that are dedicated to open access peer-reviewed books. Um, I'm not sure whether I've done any justice to how to pronounce open, but I will hand over to both Tom and Valerie to correct me on that. Over to you. Thank you, Masood, very much for that introduction to our short and uh, overview of the open access books toolkit. Before we jump in, can I just double check, Masood, can you hear us okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, so first of all, why, why do we need a toolkit? So like many of you, my role is about providing support for researchers to make their research outputs open access. Um, so over the last year or so, a collaboration of publishers, funders, research organizations, and more have worked together to deliver this free and stakeholder agnostic open access books toolkit. The aim of the toolkit is to help authors to understand open access to books and to provide them with some practical support in getting published. So, uh, like many of your organisations, open access is included as good research practice in our guidance and policies. And like many of your organisations, the University of Glasgow's approach is that outputs should be made open access wherever possible. Now, of course, some funders mandate open access to books, notably Wellcome Trust, and of course, UK Research and Innovation and Future Research Excellence Framework Exercise are considering open access to books. As well as that, authors often ask us, for example, via our central open access mailbox about making books open access. We feel quite sad because we've got very little to offer them in terms of advice or funding. And we struggle to find ways in particular to support arts researchers uh, where books are more prevalent. This is uh, Faye. Faye's an author and director of our Arts Lab in Glasgow, and Faye has helped us with input to and the advertising of the Open Access Books Toolkit at Glasgow. So the history is that I've run a few workshops over the years at the Researcher to Reader R2R conference around research information standards and open access. So in 2019, along with my friends from Springer Nature, we chose to run a workshop looking at the specific challenges associated with open access to books. The discussion showed there was clearly a demand for support and education on the options available to authors. So we approached OAPEN as a possible stakeholder agnostic home for a toolkit, and we were delighted when they agreed to work with us on this. There's an editorial advisory board with different stakeholders from publishers, research organisations and funders represented. And it really makes me very happy to say the experience has been very positive. The guidance was drafted collaboratively. Feedback in each article was taken on with the aim of ensuring impartiality. And now we have a lovely toolkit for the authors and for those whose job, like us, is to support them. And I'm a bit less sad about lacking support for them. So with that, I'll hand over to Tom, who will give you a short delve into the toolkit and let you know how you can become involved. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Valerie. Um, and as Valerie mentioned, uh, once approached and, and having learned more about the original idea, we at Awaken were very excited and, and grateful to be uh, approached as a potential host for the toolkit. Um, while we found it a, a well thought through idea and uh, were keen to get, get involved, this also meant taking into account uh, different perspectives from various stakeholders uh, involved with open access book publishing, uh, which was not a small challenge uh, to say the least. 
keeping the offers as the, uh, the main audience and the need for a stakeholder agnostic resource in mind, uh, how could we move from the concept to a practical toolkit? Uh, thanks to the support of research consulting, we were able to put together a precise product specification for this toolkit. And uh, from here, it became increasingly clear that if we were to create this toolkit, uh, it would need to be created in cooperation with the main stakeholders, moving uh, beyond the governance structure while also serving as a signposting tool. Um, as mentioned earlier, the toolkit would be governed by a large editorial advisory board. Uh, the editorial advisory board was also invited to participate in the actual creation of the toolkit, uh, writing some of the articles through a, a buddy system, being involved in uh, product decisions and making suggestions for future development after the toolkit launch. Uh, while these were all voluntary efforts, nearly all of the board members uh, chose to take part in the creation process to some extent, uh, which we believe has been essential really for creating a toolkit uh, useful for offers. Uh, having shared some of the motivations for creating the toolkit and what it aims to achieve, we'd now like to briefly walk you through the toolkit site for a, a first impression and to show some of its contents and features. Um, the Open Access Books Toolkit is uh, publicly available on its own website, oabooks-toolkit.org. And when visiting the site, uh, you'll start your journey on the homepage here, uh, where you can see a menu bar, an introduction uh, on the toolkit and its aims uh, for offers, and a number of uh, buttons uh, that one can pick from to start navigating the toolkit. The uh, four buttons at the top right of the screen, uh, Lifecycle, FAQ, Keywords, and Glossary, can all be used uh, to find your way around the toolkit, depending on what you're looking for. And as shown uh, in the previous slide, a user can make use of uh, several navigation approaches to go through the toolkit. Uh, the first being a typical uh, research lifecycle for books, uh, where the research lifecycle is broken down into eight stages, as you can see on, on the right. The research lifecycle allows researchers to quickly find the information within the toolkit uh, which could be relevant to them, uh, depending on where they currently are in the research life cycle. A researcher could, for instance, click on uh, the write and submit manuscript stage to find relevant articles to consider for this phase, such as uh, finding a publisher or what kind of services uh, he or she may expect um, from this publisher. Secondly, the frequently asked questions or FAQs provide readers with a short and concise answer to, the que to their question. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, link out to other toolkit articles or trusted sources on the web um, that provide further information on the topic for users who want to uh, find out more or go, go further. The third option you can see listed here is the glossary. Uh, as many of you uh, will know, open access and uh, open access book publishing specifically makes use of various terms that might be new for researchers and sometimes uh, cause confusion. And lastly, users can make of a keyword index to search for articles and information on certain key terms, such as licensing, funding, or marketing, and access all the articles within the toolkit, including these uh, keywords. Um, the toolkit also serves as a signposting tool. All toolkits, all toolkit articles are of a short and concise nature, bearing in mind ease of use for the user. And for users that want to learn more about a specific topic, however, such as uh, in this case here, how open access books are disseminated and made discoverable, each article will provide a vetted list of source acknowledgements, uh, references, and further readings, uh, each of which link out to existing uh, information and resources available uh, elsewhere. Um, While the toolkit is written to, uh, oh, sorry. The um, various navigation options help users quickly to quickly find what they are looking for in the toolkit. And the toolkit includes over 30 short articles, which have been uh, deliberately kept short and concise in length, allowing users to quickly move uh, from article to article or to just find what they are looking for within a minute or two. Topics discussed throughout the toolkit include uh, what is open access, uh, a myth busting article, um, on common myths about open access and an article on contract, uh, contracting and copyright, for instance. 
As you can see here, each article follows a clear structure, allowing users to uh, easily read or skim through uh, the article. And while the toolkit is written to support authors interested in uh, publishing their books open access, the toolkit also touches upon the different stakeholders and their role in the OA books landscape and how they support authors in publishing open access books. The uh, toolkit, for instance, includes articles on funders and open access books, uh, the eligibility criteria for grant applications, uh, as well as an overview of funders that provide funding for publishing an open access book. The toolkit also provides guidance on the role of research institutions, including libraries, uh, and the, the role that they may play in enabling open access book publishing and supporting their, their offers. Um, as can be expected, a number of articles are included on the role of OA book publishers, how authors can find a suitable publisher for their manuscript, and what type of services they offer um, and how they may be able to help further disseminate and market your book when it's available open access. It's been about half a year since the uh, OA Books Toolkit has been introduced. So before I close off, I'd like to briefly share a bit more about how the toolkit has been received by the community. Um, to date, we have received uh, lots of positive and also constructive feedback from authors, librarians, uh, research support staff, and publishers who have picked up on this new toolkit and uh, how it can be of use to them, showing two examples here. The first in the, the yellow box um, of a toolkit uh, tester and author in the arts, appreciative of the clear guidance and supporting role the toolkit, tool, the toolkit can play for authors and editors at all stages of their academic career. And the second of a librarian who has incorporated the toolkit into the uh, local library guide. In terms of uh, usage, the toolkit website has seen over 20,000 unique page views uh, ever since it has been uh, introduced. And we have seen the toolkit being used in over 140 countries uh, so far, where most users come from the US, uh, followed by the UK. And while the Awaken Toolkit has its own uh, website, we also very much encourage other organizations such as libraries and publishers to incorporate uh, the toolkit or some of its relevant aspects into their local resources um, where helpful. And here we see a few examples of libraries who have uh, done so already. Uh, finally, now that the toolkit is live, I'd like to uh, emphasize it will be regularly updated and maintained by the uh, Global and Multi-Stakeholder Editorial Advisory Board. Um, future developments can be expected in terms of new articles and technical features based on user feedback. Um, so thanks very much for taking an interest in the OA Books Toolkit. Uh, and we look forward to hearing your uh, initial thoughts and questions uh, either here or via the uh, link provided uh, at the final slide. Thank you very much, Valerie and Tom, um, for a fantastic presentation, particularly uh, the different entry routes of how people can uh, enter this discussion through the whole research life cycle as well. I think that's uh, absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure lots of libraries will be looking at this if they haven't already uh, done so. So thank you very much. May I now invite the members of the panel to um, uh, start their webcams and we can now go into the joint question and answer session. Um, what a fascinating series of talks and thank you so much for taking us in this journey from global partnerships to open scholarship communities to uh, open research and uh, both digitally and physically building digital scholarship uh, capabilities as well as um, open access publishing as well as digital transformation and its impact on not just what it means for student experience but, but also what it means for student employment and their capabilities in the long run. Uh, absolutely amazing, and I really enjoyed this session. Um, I appreciate that we are running uh, short in time, but if it's okay with all of you and with particularly with the audience, I think we, we ought to run over because there's a fascinating series of questions that have come through that we should tackle. Um, so I'm going to pick up on the first question, which is um, uh, about uh, the um, open access community, the open scholarship communities. I think particularly this one is for Hardy, I assume, from the question, which is um, that the community you were talking about in Galway Hardy was about open education as well as research. 
um, and involves students as well as academics. And the question is, can you say a bit more about any impact that that's had for the student experience? Um, yeah, so I have to say that at the beginning, we actually, so our first members were mainly academic staff um, and open, ex well, enthusiasts, but also experts. I think um, there is a hurdle or a little barrier for students to join because they think you have to be an expert to join. And, but that is obviously not the case. We want to encourage uh, students uh, who identify with, who see the benefits of working openly, but also who support the values that underpin the whole open idea. And the way to do this also going forward is to make our community a more a social experience. So I actually saw a, a, a comment on Twitter where there's someone said, oh, this community actually sounds like fun. It's not another committee. And I think this goes to the very heart of the experience, which is relevant for students, obviously not only for students, to make this uh, an inclusive community where you can learn. So it's a learning community, a sharing community, but also a community where you can connect with like-minded um, students and staff. Thank you very much, Hardy. Um, I'll pick up on another question, which is, uh, I assume for Phil and Josh, um, which is during your presentation, you mentioned that you position the library where there's no separation between physical and digital. Can you elaborate a bit more on that and what it means for the future of services uh, on, on, on digital scholarship? Sure, um, I'll, I'll pick it up first, maybe, and um, Josh, maybe you could come in. Um, I, I guess for us, it's, it's, it's acknowledging that whilst we're all kind of living a blended life of uh, and experiencing digital and, and physical together, there's still very much a sense that, that digital in libraries is either a threat or a, uh, a compromise um, uh, uh, or, or something that's in a particular niche. And, and, and it's really a desire and a vision to bring those two together so that there isn't a separation. And what that means practically, I guess, is making sure that, that, that when people are in our physical library building, um, that they're fully immersed in the digital aspects of that and gaining value from that as well. But equally, the, in terms of being inclusive to our wider communities, the things that we're doing in, in the practical um, uh, or, or the physical domain um, are extended out uh, and not just through making recordings or, of events or but, but really engaging so that you connect across the two and I don't think we've got the answers to all of those but I think those are our ambitions uh, and that's what we'd like to see uh, see happening. Um, Josh? Don't know if you yeah know. no I've got some thoughts I think um, almost building on what Hardy said um, it's also about engaging with our communities across both spaces um, the digital and the physical. I mean, I've always been taken by the work of um, R. David Lang, so I think is at the University of South Carolina now, and he frames libraries as natural matchmakers. And I think that's absolutely true. We're adept at bringing people together. We're good at connecting people. So we've got to do that within in-person settings, but also within digital environments. Um, Lancaster had uh, strong digital foundations going into the pandemic and the pivot to online forced us to build on those foundations. And it didn't take us long to start bringing people together within online environments, for example, through our staff development groups, midday seminar series or data conversations. Um, but we worked really hard to emulate those serendipitous encounters online too, for example, through um, our coffee roulette events where staff from across the library join a team session with a brew um, before being randomly assigned to a breakout room where they can catch up with people that they might not interact with um, online through their day-to-day -day activities. So as I say, irrespective of whether we're operating in the physical space or within the digital space, we'll continue to be a thriving, dynamic and people-focused library that brings our communities together to co-create and, and share knowledge that leads to greater understanding, um, insight and innovation. Um, it comes back to that joy, it comes back to people and it always comes back to um, our community. Thank you, Phil and Josh. And uh, what a good point to make that uh, innovation and fun are quite strongly aligned with each other. Uh, I think the next question is for uh, Rosie. And Rosie, there's a question about 
the impact of digital developments and the positive impact it can have on uh, student experience and student satisfaction. Um, and how, but also the challenges that you are highlighting that if all of the focus is there, then you're not developing the students uh, more uh, social skills or more um, soft skills. Where do you think the balance lies? Because there are always limited resources and, uh, and how do we balance that in, in, in this age and world? That's an excellent question, Masood. I'm not sure um, exactly where we, I think it totally depends on the situation where we find the balance. I think um, student satisfaction is obviously very important and SS scores are hugely important. Um, but I think um, we just need to be considering where we're putting a developer the development in and um, if, it, if it might have a negative impact in one area it might have a massive positive impact um, elsewhere and it's just that we need to be aware um, and see if we can mitigate the, ne the next sort of the negative um, aspect of it so for example um, in the keynote yesterday Keris was talking about how in recruitment nowadays um, it's quite common for um, applicant tracking systems to be used using artificial intelligence to um, scan vast numbers of job applications. So now what a lot of career centers are investing in is platforms that allow students to mimic that experience. So a student can put their CV in through a system for review and not only do they get feedback, but they're being looked at by similar algorithms to what they'd experience in recruitment. It also means, though, you know, in, there's also an element of CV building that you can have on these platforms. And it does mean that the student doesn't have to learn as much about how to do a good CV. Um, it means that it's they're, they're not having to work as hard to get um, a good CV for recruitment. But it so they're sort of you could argue that they're, they're losing some of the learning opportunity there. But it. It, the, the bonus of it is that it's giving them the opportunity to practice with a real life um, kind of system that's going to give them the same feedback as you would in the recruitment um, experience. And also it means that when they if they do then have an, an appointment with a careers advisor, that they can have a real qualitative conversation rather than the careers advisor just correcting the typos, because at the moment that's um, what a lot of the time is spent with careers advisors correcting things that that system could do for them. Yeah, absolutely. And raises some very interesting points in the future about uh, what does it mean to be authentic in the way you deliver things when everything is being uh, driven towards systems as well. Uh, really, really uh, good point, Rosie. Um, uh, a particular question about um, a global partnership, Alan, and particularly on uh, what were some of the key lessons you learned during your own experience and what would be your message to others who want to establish a similar partnership? How, how should they get on uh, with this process as well? Thanks, Masood. Um, I, I really think uh, finding those partners within your institution in the first instance, I think was it's absolutely the most, the most precious thing where there's uh, real experience. I mean, we always have a tendency in libraries to kind of go, oh yeah, we could do that. And um, that's not necessarily a good plan. Uh, you know, we, other people have enormous expertise and we should lean on those people. Um, so I, I'd say that was a huge part of it. I think the other thing is that um, uh, people are interested and there are opportunities there um, and you don't hear about them unless you actually are out and, and actively involved in those things. Um, so I think the more we can be kind of active presences in our institutions, uh, the better chance we have of actually uh, having those knocks on the door and making those connections. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I hope uh, you and the audience can indulge us for a few more minutes because stream of questions is still coming through. So it's hugely, hugely appreciated. Um, uh, there's a question for Tom and Valerie, which is about any granular analytics. Um, are there any granular analytics that are produced by the OAPEN tool? And uh, particularly to suggest areas of greater interest to researchers? Shall I answer the question, Valerie? And you can jump in perhaps. Um, so I, I didn't include it in, in this presentation, but we uh, did take a, a look at, at this. At, more granular level um, and it's a bit early because it has only been launched six months ago but we did I think uh, see 
two things in terms of when we looked at the most frequently visited articles, uh, which included uh, articles on uh, business models for open access books um, and a list of funding sources for open access books. So trying to understand, uh, to learn more about how to um, publish a book open access and not just uh, look at the, the funding opportunities, but also different business models that are out there um, for which funding uh, is not directly required. And secondly, there was quite some, there's quite some interest in the article on comparing open access books to open access journals. How do they differ? Um, um, and also the article on common, common myths about open access. So the myth busting article uh, along with the article explaining more introductory article on what is open access more generally. Um, I think those are two yeah, trends that we have seen in the, in the usage uh, so far. Valerie, do you have anything to add to that or anything on how successful it's been at Glasgow? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing um, feedback from other sites though. So hope to hear from some of the people maybe that are on the call today. That sounds great and sounds like a great invitation for others to speak with Valerie afterwards as well. Um, a couple of more questions and I'm wary of time, but I think it's really, really good that we can pick on these. I think this is probably for Hardy, Josh and Phil which is about um, uh, what changes to roles or structures do you see developing from your open scholarship and research engagements that are happening in your own respective institutions at the moment? So uh, if I invite Phil and Josh to go first and then Hardy, that would be really beneficial. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, happy, happy to pick up. Um, so thinking around digital scholarship here rather than open research for the moment, although of course there's an intersection um, I think partly this process is about recognizing the skill sets, capabilities and strengths that exist already within academic libraries, um, metadata curation, collections management, um, TEI, XML, you know, there are skill sets that we have that we can leverage and we can call on. That's not to say that there aren't opportunities to build skill sets um, and support colleagues to engage in relevant staff development opportunities. Um, I think I'd also say I'm a big fan of Kolb's work on experiential learning. I think it's really easy to spend a long time in the abstract conceptualization phase of the experiential process. Um, and that's a longhand way of saying that sometimes it's about getting stuck in and learning on the job. Um, and you also have the opportunity then when you're working alongside academic colleagues to benefit from their knowledge um, and experience. And in that way, you can build on the concrete experience and refine that iterative process that ultimately leads to library and information professionals being upskilled and qualified in new areas and building on their existing strengths to deliver those digital scholarship uh, projects. So those are some observations for me. I don't know if you want to add anything, Phil. Uh, just a quick point, really, that I think builds on what both you and uh, and Hardy have, have said, that I don't, I don't think that we anticipate that all of these skills will be developed or held within the library. And, and it's very much about community and blurring the edges between the work that the library does and that our academic colleagues do and doing that work together. So uh, we, we, we develop those roles and structures uh, almost by removing some of the structure that exists between us so that we um, have people working alongside us day to day. Um, and that provides the opportunity for that experiential learning. Um, that's certainly the benefits we've seen to date. Yeah, maybe, Masood, you're, you're on mute, um, but maybe I'll just add um, that um, I think all, all academic libraries, at least the more research intense ones, should have an open scholarship librarian. Now, it doesn't have to be the, the um, job title open scholarship librarian, but it should be someone who oversees all the open practices, because I think there is a danger of working in silos. Um, so I think someone committed to uh, overlooking and supporting that on a broader um, broader spectrum is, is important. Just one word to our communities. So I think each community has, a, a, it's called coordinator, 
Now, this could be a librarian, but I know a lot of the Dutch communities actually, it, it's someone in the research office. Again, this is where the blurred, ident you know, the blurred roles come in again. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm not sure it's that important where they sit, but we need that, uh, you know, capacity um, and it will grow. Um, just, you know, what Utrecht have now, I think they're close to 400 members. So they really need someone looking after that community. We're not on that scale, but once you think about where this might go, you do have to think about um, building capacity. Thank you, Hardy, and thank you for lip reading what I was saying as well. Uh, I think uh, I'll take one last question and then we have to conclude this session. But um, uh, Rosie, I think this one is for you again, which uh, firstly, uh, many congratulations, people are really saying thank you for your presentation as well. And um, one question is, how wide do you think the concerns you've shared uh, resonate uh, across the institution, and particularly do they resonate within the academic library community? Um, yeah, thank you for that, that really positive feedback. Um, I think so, yes. Um, I think it's probably really important for me to acknowledge that the service that I work in at the moment um, is tiny compared to um, most academic libraries. And we have kind of fewer plates to balance, as it were. Um, and I think a really important part that I, I didn't really touch on in my presentation is that obviously staff time is and, and kind of how we use our and how kind of how our human resource is used is a really important factor as well. So in many cases, um, digital developments can help us um, kind of use our staff time more qualitatively rather than um, dealing with things that um, a machine, uh, for want of a better word, um, can deal with. So I think they are shared, but, but I also think that there's so many different factors that uh, lead into these decisions that again it's it's very difficult to to balance them all 